You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Acuna Capital. Known as the new wave in tech and trading, Acuna is a leading derivatives market maker in traditional asset classes. As one of the first trading firms to make markets on Bitcoin futures, Acuna is also proud to be an innovator in the cryptocurrency space. Through a collaborative flow of knowledge between developers, quants, and traders, Acuna designs and implements their own low latency technologies, trading strategies, and mathematical models. To learn more about our rapidly growing firm, please visit acunacapital.com. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. New music means it's time for a new show here on the Options Insider Radio Network. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown, the program where the name pretty much says it all. We're going to break down the exploding, interesting, volatile, perhaps not as volatile as you think, but volatile world of crypto trading, Bitcoin, all the other digital assets, all coin out there that is trading. My name is Mark Longo from the old optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting Options Insider Radio Network. And you know, you guys have been asking us for the better part of a year. When are you guys going to get into crypto? When are you going to launch a crypto show? When are you going to launch a crypto show? And we, we really wanted to take our time with this. We wanted to look, we wanted to get a feel for the marketplace. Place. You want to get a feel for the players therein. You know, whenever a new marketplace explodes on the scene, the way crypto has, particularly here in Chicago over the past year and change, we've seen a lot of new entrants, a lot of old entrants in the space getting into crypto as well. A lot of, shall we say, less than reputable players also flying in that space as well. So we want to make sure we did our due diligence, did our homework, found good players to represent the space on the show, and also had a good show with some meat behind it to actually talk about. And we're finally there now launching it in in the new year here of 2019. We're very excited. What does this show have in store for you? Well, a lot of good stuff. We're going to model a lot of our other programming in terms of what you can expect from this show. So we'll have a great segment breaking down all of the latest trading activity in Bitcoin, as you might imagine. That's, uh, of course, the, the product that's still leading the dance. That's going to cover all the things. So the coins, as well as, of course, with futures and even OTC side on the options. You know, there aren't any, really any real listed options yet, but there's a lot of uh, OTC stuff going on. And we have some good partners to help us dig into the ladder here on the program. I am pleased to be joined. He's been on the network before, but he is the first time sitting down in the old co-host seat. He is Toby Allen, 
the head of digital assets over there at Acuna Capital. Tony, welcome to this inaugural episode of the Crypto Rundown, sir. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us, and congratulations on on launching the new show. We're uh, really excited here at Acuna to be a part of it, and um, we look forward to joining you from time to time. Well, Toby, obviously, you know, you guys have been on the network before on different programs. This is the first time kind of really uh, holding down a a specific show. Why don't you go ahead for some of our listeners? Obviously, this is going to bring a lot of new players to the mix in terms of our network who maybe aren't as familiar with the traditional option space. So why don't you go ahead and give the audience a little bit of an overview of, first off, of your background in the space, and then what the heck is Acuna? What do you guys do, and what is the digital assets desk over there do? Sure thing. Uh, I'm going to do those questions in reverse order, but um, Akuna is a proprietary trading firm based out here in Chicago, uh, specializing in, in trading global derivatives. Uh, we've got four offices now, Chicago, uh, Boston, Sydney, Australia, Shanghai, uh, China. Uh, crypto is a small part of that business, a, a growing part of that business, like it's sort of growing everywhere and uh, you know we expect it to keep growing um, uh, in terms of crypto we trade electronically across many different uh, global exchanges um, in, in both physical and uh, derivatives uh, we have an OTC desk um, which you referenced a little bit ago that, that uh, is unique in that it's trading uh, options um, with counterparties uh, and then thirdly we have some uh, small venture capital type investments where we think we can add uh, value to uh, startups in in the crypto space. Uh, And then my background is as an options trader. Um, Traded everything from energies to uh, S&P and NASDAQ and um, equities, VIX, rates, uh, but always specializing in options. Uh, so the crypto world, which is predominantly uh, Delta One, has been unique for me. And, um, you know, it's been very exciting to be part of it the last 18 months. Well, let's get into that with a little bit of our first here, our inaugural segment for the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for... The Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, welcome to this inaugural Bitcoin Breakdown segment. Again, the name kind of says it all. This is the portion of the show where we're going to break down the trading activity, usually in all things Bitcoin across the broad spectrum of products. So you're talking, you know, the coins on the various venues there, as well as the futures and indeed the options and other things going on. Bitcoin related Bitcoin, of course, still the majority of the market cap over there. Of course, in future shows, we'll have interview segments and guests and all kinds of other fun stuff. We'll talk about the altcoin universe as well. Don't worry if you're an Ether or Litecoin or an XRP guy. We're not going to forget about you on the program either. But uh, for now, for this inaugural episode, we're going to focus on Bitcoin. And actually, we're going to start the show instead of looking ahead, looking back a little bit. We actually, uh, Toby, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we kind of picked an auspicious day to launch this new program because we are 10 years and one day from the launch of with the creation really uh, of Bitcoin the initial block of 50 coins the genesis block was uh, was created there on January 3rd 2009 we are recording this on the 4th of January here 2019 that sounds so distant into the future but 10 years and a day and what a what a what a run it has been over the past decade. A lot of people are cranking, crunching those numbers, looking auspicious dates, including CNBC and a number of others. And looking here, 2009 was when the first ever later that year is when the first ever Bitcoin transaction took place. Actually, it was January 9th, so about a week later. Uh, then uh, it was between the old uh, Nakamoto and a uh, software developer. Then another developer in 2010 made the first, what they believe to be the first, May 2010, the first real-world transaction. <laughs> this poor guy spent 10,000 Bitcoins on two Papa John's pizzas. So um, by today's math, that would be about a $30 million pizzas, $30 million worth of pizza. So I'm sure that guy kind of regrets that purchase. At the height of last year, it was worth a lot more. So uh, he probably felt it even more. 2010 is when it started to get a lot more public attention uh, with the launch of Mt. Gox. We all kind of know how the Mt. Gox situation ended, perhaps not not the best. Uh, 2011, the Bitcoin hit a dollar. That was a milestone at the time uh, for pricing. Uh, but then we also saw the hacks start to emerge on venues like Mt. Gox, and that's when uh, things started to go awry. 2014 was a, the big uh, Mt. Gox hack. Bitcoin also hit 300 that year, 
And it pretty much stayed in that range for the better part of three years until, of course, 2017, I want to say last year, but it's already uh, over last year, <laughs> coming up on two years ago now, is where, of course, beginning of 2017 is really when this started to get the fever pitch for a lot of people out there in the crypto space. Bitcoin crossing again over the 1,000 level it back in the beginning of the year, then hitting 2,000, so effectively doubling by July. And then, of course, we all know the trajectory went on from there, going up to almost 20,000 by December. Then a slew of new products were launched. And then we got into 2018, and the frenzy was really on. Everyone had the crypto bit in the teeth, uh, so to speak. So, Toby, uh, you guys obviously launched a new desk at the height of that frenzy. Uh, first off, when did you launch the uh, the digital assets desk there, and what was what was kind of the genesis behind it? What was really the impetus for really wanting to launch that? And then, particularly in the early frenzy days uh, of last year with crypto, what kind of trades were you seeing going up there? Uh, yeah, so we launched in uh, Q3 2017, which ironically is a, uh, about where prices are right now. Um, so we saw um, the latter part of, of the big run-up in 2017 that you referenced, and then in, in 2018, um, we've we've obviously seen the 75% plus fall in, in, in Bitcoin. Um, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, coverage on on how much it's fallen in in 2018, and I have to keep sort of reminding myself we're now in 2019. But uh, sort of yeah, 2018 was was a dark year for for prices. But when you put it in perspective of where it was at the start of 2017, um, it, it's not quite as uh, dark and gloomy. And I think that just speaks to um, uh, sort of how much overhype and, and the bubble that happened in, in 2017 and, and the space certainly got ahead of itself. But um, we certainly here don't look at it um, as uh, look at 2018 as, as pessimistically as maybe some of the media outlets do. Yeah, what was what was the I didn't realize you launched it into in the queue into late 2017. I thought you launched it in early 2018. So you're actually there for kind of the, ta- the tail end of the run up and then kind of the, I, th- I think the height of the frenzy, which is probably Q1 uh, of last year in terms of everyone and their grandmother literally hitting us up about all things crypto. What was it like making markets in the Delta One stuff? And indeed, you guys do the options as well in the options as well, particularly in those go-go crazy times of, you know, late 2017 into Q1 of 2018. What, what was that scene like? Yeah, I mean, it, the space has come so far in, in 18 months. When, when we first got into it, we weren't in the options. We started the options in, in Q1 2018. Um, but in, in 2017, in, in just the Delta One space, you had all these different exchanges with enormous fragmentation um, where uh, it was all about not so much about trading. It was about um, your your business operations side of having the right accounts open and being able to just move things um, when you wanted to into places you wanted to. You, there was huge arbitrage opportunities, markets where, um, you know, entire percentage points wide. Um, now when you look at markets, it's more like, you know, how many single basis points. So markets have gone from more than 100 basis points wide to less than 10 basis points wide in um a little over a year in, in the Delta One space. In the options side of things, um, you know, it's a new market, uh, a lot of new entrants, a lot of people who the concept of options, is, um, uh, options and, and derivatives, even futures, swaps, those kinds of things uh, are new to them. So understanding them and um, trading them uh, is, is not what we're used to in the traditional asset space, and it takes a little longer to, to grasp um, you know, payoffs and structures and, and how they work. And, and so um, in 2018, we saw a lot of growth in, in those products, but really it's a, a slow, educating, more steady growth pattern than what we saw in the price in 2017 and <laughs> so, even 2018. So would you say then it was a lot of primarily new entrants who were hitting you guys up on the options and on the Delta One desk in, in 2018 with people coming from the crypto world wanting to learn how to hedge or were they players in the traditional financial space who wanted to maybe dip their toes in the crypto waters? What, what would you say was the primarily flow, particularly in the early days? Yeah, uh, the early the early days was, was a lot of speculators from the traditional asset space. Um, so it was either 
uh, hedge funds that had um, opened up crypto um, legs um, and, and understood derivative products. Um, and then towards the tail end of 2018, we started seeing um, more of the, the businesses and um, people with exposure to the underlying who'd experienced, um, you know, big losses or, or maybe just paper losses um, in, in their holdings. And, you know, they have, if you think of something like a mining company where their revenues are derived in Bitcoin and, and their costs are in fiat in terms of the computers they're buying, the electricity, the rent, the wages they're paying, all those things, um, they started realizing or uh, getting an appetite for, for hedging. And, um, you know, the onset of the CME and CBOE futures um, and, and other derivative products certainly helped those um, real businesses in the space uh, find ways to, to hedge their, their business exposures. And it's just taken time for, for people to, you know, utilize those products that are out there. You know, this is why I'm glad we have this show here and, and you guys on to help us talk about that because you have the actual data at hand because we've been asked this question so many times throughout all of 2018. And we had, you know, anecdotal answers, but nothing really, you know, nothing empirical we could sink our teeth into. I, think, I do believe we have a listener question on a similar vein later, so I don't want to dwell too much on skewing things. I think that's what the listener wants to know a little bit later. But we, we've been asked a lot of times, uh, Toby, about, you know, what were people using the options for? Was there a predominant use case, particularly coming into 2018? You know, the coins were, Bitcoin was flirting around 20,000. It was at extreme all-time valuation levels. You know, there's a lot of speculation where people coming in, were, was it like the heyday, shall we say, of Apple when they were the darling of the street and every earnings, all people wanted to do was buy calls and the calls were a bit out of, out of control? Was it all they wanted to do was hedge and so they, or maybe get out and so they wanted to have puts? What was the predominant use case, particularly on the options desk in those early days? Was was there one, or was the flow kind of all over the place? Yeah, uh, the SKUs definitely followed the the trend in the market. So early on, when we launched the, the options, you know, Bitcoin was at all time highs. Um, volatility was was much higher. Volatility, to put that in perspective, was around 150 uh, this time last year. Um, uh, by the third quarter of 2018 volatility in bitcoin was lower than 30 um so to put that in perspective um vix vol is generally sort of 80 to 100 um so um we certainly saw a big change throughout the year it's back up from those lows of sort of mid to high 20s um, to around 75 vol right now with, with recent moves. But I think the point you're getting at is, is uh, yeah, the skew. Um, early on, it was all about calls. Calls were trading much higher than, than puts in, t in volatility terms and relative to at the money vols. And as the year went on and we saw more and more downward pressure in the underlying, the, the skew flipped around. Um, and now... Um, we, we describe it here like a bit of a Nike swoosh where the out the money is the, the pit of the Nike swoosh, the cheapest vol on the board, and then you have really steep uh, puts uh, where put vols are much higher than the out the money is and, and significantly so. And calls are also a little bit higher, but it's a much slower, gradual rise away from the money than, than those puts are. So there you go. You know, I, I always kind of thought that, but, you know, we, you, you hear a lot of arguments, uh, you know, for both ways that it would, it would look like an index with the calls being cheap and the puts being expensive because people wanted they're primarily long and they wanted to hedge others. You know, the, the speculators, the zealots, like kind of like the Apple analogy, I kind of thought it would lean that way. And it's interesting to hear that that's kind of how it sh how it shook out, at least for the beginning uh, of the year until, of course, the downside started emerging. And we started to see uh, probably a more pronounced bid to the puts, not surprisingly there. Of course, the downside was kind of the theme of the year for 2018, as you kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, throughout uh, the entire year, we saw, you know, market caps uh, trading down. Obviously, as you see, the Bitcoin, the lead coin going from about 20,000 down. It's hovering around the 4,000, a little bit shy of that right now. I'll have to pull up the... Uh, where the, where the futures and others are trading right now, but they were around, I think, 3,700 uh, coming into the latter portion here 
of the week. There's been a lot of talk, you know, can it sustain that 4,000 level? And it seems like, like it has, and it breaks through a little bit, but it seems like 4,000 is kind of where people are starting to aggregate around, at least here in the near term. Of course, a year ago, the market cap for Bitcoin alone was about 220, almost $221 billion at the end of December, uh, coming in, uh, coming into the end of December of 2018. It was about $70 billion. So it's come off quite a bit. We saw similar changes uh, in things like uh, Litecoin and uh, Ether and uh, XRP as well. We also saw volume kind of peaking in places like uh, Coinbase out there. And, you know, they hit uh, their peak back in uh, fourth quarter. And Q1, about the same for both of them. Q1 2018 and fourth quarter, right around, looks like about, they quoted in like notional dollar value, about $45 billion, it seems like. Uh, Q1 over there in uh, Binance was about, looks like about $225 billion. Uh, so running away with it there and then kind of uh, coming off a little bit. Come, this data only goes to Q3, about $100 billion for Binance and about, it's like about $10 plus billion uh, for Coinbase. I'd imagine Q4 probably somewhere in that level. But we've seen some more volatility kicking in and other things. So I wouldn't be surprised if those numbers are actually a little bit higher coming in. And, of course, it hasn't all been a story of downside like you mentioned. There's some new products on the table. Of course, a year ago, everyone was racing to launch the futures. We saw SIBO and CME launching products, SIBO launching a one-coin future, CME launching a five-coin future. Uh, if you had asked me which one I thought was going to lead the dance, well, I think we have a question about that, too, so I won't spoil that. We'll get that a little bit as well. But uh, surprising results there. But it's been a strong year uh, for CME. They listed their numbers recently throughout the year. ADV, obviously, me starting from zero. It's going to be a growth story, and that's pretty much what they had. Uh, they saw Q4 ADV up 120% compared to Q1, so kind of the opposite story of what everyone else had going on. But then again, of course, starting from a much lower uh, baseline. They have a decent number of accounts actually trading. Looks like about uh, 2,000 or so uh, accounts. Uh, 50% over, about 50% of the volume coming during non-U.S. trading hours. So again, speaking to the international audience that is trading a lot of crypto interesting stuff they had some records november 20th was their record day about 14 and a half, 14,500 contracts about 72,000 equivalent bitcoins going up or about 310 or so million dollars worth of coins going on so, so the future is representing a small number but a growing amount there and the open interest in the chart there is interesting as well do you guys do a lot of uh, on, on the digital desk do you guys get a lot of demand do you do a lot in the uh, the SIBO or CME futures or is it primarily the other products there Toby um, yeah we've been involved uh, with both those exchanges since day one when when they launched um, and you know uh, we, we pride ourselves that we were early to the party there and um, we participated in the very first trades on, on both exchanges. Um, uh, the, the majority of our business is still in that Delta One stuff in the futures um, and CBOE and CME are, are both part um, of that global mix of volume. So yes, certainly. Yeah, you know, it has been interesting to watch that kind of uh, that horse race play out. Again, we have a, some questions about that later, so I won't uh, I won't go down too much on that rabbit hole. But you touched on the volatility earlier, Toby. Uh, that's an interesting story. You know, I think throughout the entirety uh, of 2019, I got to thank our buddies Nick and the team at Quick Strike for giving us some of this data here. You know, the, the narrative was Bitcoin is volatile. Bitcoin is volatile. In fact, there was even a plot, I believe, of the show Silicon Valley revolved around the notion that Bitcoin is volatile, and every time it hit a certain price level, it would trigger some really annoying death metal alarm in some guy computer or something like that so it was a, it was an ongoing theme of, of the episode so it had reached that level of cultural saturation it was just considered a a, a, a a matter of fact that bitcoin was an extremely volatile instrument but when you crunch the numbers not as you, you kind of alluded to them earlier not quite as volatile as you think again this data coming from a our friends over there in Quick Strike land, and most for the most of 2018. This is from pretty much Q1 on, so March until the end of the year. So Q1's not in there, but the data is pretty much the same for that. Uh, where we see most of the volatility banded in this, and people have this reception: oh, it's a thousand percent, ten thousand percent volatility. Nowhere near that. It's banded for most of the year, and in, in this round 40 to the lower end, they, they got a little bit lower, but it, in most of the time, in that 40 to 90 odd percent range of the volatility with uh, hovering most of the time uh, around, you know, that uh, looks like about a 60, low 60 percent, 65 or so percent vol. And with some spikes, obviously, recently in Q4 in December, things got volatile, spiked up over 120, about 130 percent. And uh, but we saw it also get as low as below 20 percent back and uh, this is in mid-November or so, right before the vol kind of took off. We saw another move in uh, in the Bitcoin there. So Bitcoin, yeah, it's, it's not any more volatile than a, 
of a somewhat volatile equity, uh, quite frankly. Is, is that kind of like you kind of alluded to that, Toby? Is that kind of your read as well that, you know, Bitcoin has this popular perception that it's the most volatile thing on the planet? But the reality is that it's nothing more turbulent than, you know, your average somewhat tumultuous equity. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for for a lot of the year, as you just talked about, we, we saw vol uh, less than 60 and even got as low as, yeah, 20. And at that stage, uh, the, the running joke in the office was, you know, what product didn't have a lower, uh, sorry, what product actually uh, had a lower vol than, <laughs> than Bitcoin when it got down into those 20s? Yeah, it got something um, pretty boring, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It felt really felt like a, a currency or an interest rate product at that stage. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, what's, that's what's funny about it. You know, there's so many misperceptions floating around there about Bitcoin that it is this extremely volatile monster that will devour grandmothers and children and everything else. And you're right, and that particularly getting into Q4, into that November period, it was... It was as boring almost as any any T bill until we started rocking and rolling again. It has the potential to do more, but obviously it can languish as well. Uh, since we're talking ball, let's do a real quick rundown on some of the other coins too. We'll give you a little taste of the altcoin. We'll do more obviously on other shows. Uh, Ether, all you Ether heads out there, uh, it's similar range, a little bit higher structurally uh, from a ball perspective. Uh, looking at like the lower band around seventy percent and the upper band around one hundred and twenty percent, with some peaks peak over one hundred and forty, and again the low point down in November. November around 30%. It looks like it's averaging around almost 196%, so a little bit more structurally volatile than Bitcoin, but not a ton. Again, to be expected, it's a much lower price, uh, a different price instrument. XRP, of course, the, the Ripple, uh, also similar deal, even more volatile. Again, a lower price instrument there. Uh, this The band there is around a 90 to about 160 or so, 155%. And with some spikes, it spiked over 200% briefly in October, got down to about a low of about 85% or so. It's like back in mid-November with uh, the average, it looks like coming in around, uh, around 120 some odd percent in that range. So a lot of that, we'll, we'll quickly touch on, we'll touch on Litecoin too. Why not? Why, why exclude them? Uh, a similar story there too as well. A volatility banned for most of 2018 in the around 65% on the downside up to about 110% on the upside with some with some peaks and some troughs. A trough around it's like about 30% back in November and about 150 close to a percent in uh, in late in mid December and the average around again 90% too. So the all altcoin or the altcoin I should say a little bit more structurally volatile than uh, the Bitcoin. You guys get a lot of demand for the uh, the altcoin over there, and you've been have you been surprised by the volatility or maybe lack thereof of those products as well, Toby? Um, yeah, I mean, we, so uh, on the option side of things, we just tr- we stick to Bitcoin and Ethereum. On the uh, futures for its physical side, we we trade all um, the a lot of oh, all those alt- other altcoins uh, you you mentioned. Um, we see a lot of demand in. Uh, those other coins in in the Delta One space, and we do often get inquiries for options in those products. It's just a lot harder when the smaller once you get to smaller coins, there's more information asymmetry, and um, you don't really want to have a smaller liquid book around big unknown forks and those kind of things in in the uh, less established coins. So we're a little bit careful about which um, products we, we uh, trade in the option space. But certainly in the Delta One space, we're, we're constantly trading those things and trading them against other coins and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I like that. It's a good euphemistic term, information asymmetry. I like that. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, well, you know, we touched a lot on, on 2018. Any other final thoughts on the year that was for Bitcoin or crypto before we get into some of the listener questions here, Toby? No, look, I mean, I'd add a couple of things, just that, um, you know, the focus has been on the, the price movement this year, but um, I, I think what people need to think about, um, and of course these are my views, not necessarily the company's views, um, but that uh, is, to, is, is that what's important is the underlying use cases. And when you think about uh, something like Bitcoin, um, it's it's, predominant use cases as a store of wealth or transfer of wealth. And if you're going to have an instrument that doing those things, then you want to see lower volatility. I think we've seen that this year. We've seen a downward trend in volatility. Um, and then you want to see uh, you know, storage 
or safe custody, safe storage, um, insurable solutions for, for ways people can access the asset class. And I think we've seen that too. So uh, the underlying themes have been really strong in 2018, even if the price action hasn't. All right, let's see if your questions are also strong with our inaugural crypto question segment. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody, welcome to the crypto questions. You guys have questions? We, we try to have the answers here for you. A lot of interesting stuff, a bunch here. We'll see how many we can get to. Let's start off. Toby, this has to be, I mentioned the SKU one. We have that one as well later. We kind of touched on that already. But the number one question we received by far over the course of 2018 by an order of magnitude and is represented again here by user listener 77RT. They want to know the, the kind of magic question. When will we see Bitcoin options on an exchange? You know, we were waiting for that. We waited for quite some time. That's one of the reasons why we delayed the launch of this show. Finally, we said the heck with them. We don't have to wait anymore. They're, obviously, you can already trade these things right now. Toby has just outlined that. So they do exist. They are out there ready to be traded. Why wait for CME or SIBO uh, to get their acts together when it comes to the crypto front? But that said, this is an interesting question. I've waited on this before. I'm, I'm sure you have as well, Toby. But I'll, I'll give you maybe the dubious honor of going first on this one. You obviously interact with the exchanges on a regular basis. You're making markets in these products. Uh, what do you think? People are asking us now. Last year, we did a poll this time. And we asked our audience, you know, when do you think we'll see Bitcoin options? Everyone said Q1. I was, I was the comparative laggard. I said Q2. Of course, the year has come and gone. We did not see them. But what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What do you expect for 2019 when it comes to listed Bitcoin options? Do you have any hope for them coming online this year? Uh, Mark, well, we, we would love to see them as soon as possible. The sooner the better in, in our eyes. Um, as to when that is. You know, we're not exactly sure. We haven't heard anything from, from either exchange. Uh, our expectation is that it'll probably be CME before CBOE in that CBOE's got a big technology migration with BATS going on. Um, so uh, CME certainly has the open door in, in that uh, regard in terms of they can probably beat CBOE to market if, if they want. Uh, but... Potentially, at some stage, uh, one of these Fridays, we need to get someone on from the CME and the CBOE and ask them ourselves. Yeah, I, I've done that. We've had them on before, <laughs> and uh, I try to hold their feet to the fire. I had CME on a panel with me not too long ago uh, at a conference here. I, I've held their feet to their, fi their fire on this topic on a number of occasions, both of them. And you're right, CBO has kind of demurred with and kind of laid the blame at the feet of the technology you notice the technology didn't stop them from launching the futures, but now it seems to be a huge stumbling block to launching the options. I can maybe see some of that. It is a little bit more tech-intensive tech product. Uh, but still, you know, they raced out of the gate with the futures. Same thing with, with CME. They both raced each other out of the gate, and now they're both pumping the brakes. In fact, um, when I talk to some of the CME people, even though they're right, I, I definitely think they would be the first to launch it because their product has more volume and seems to be more impetus behind it right now. But they, they, they seem more interested in launching additional futures before options as well, which to me is maybe it's just the options guy in me. It seems kind of mystifying. I want the options on the future so you could obviously it will accre they will accrete more volume as a result. But say la vie, I, I do think we'll see some this year. I, I, I won't go out on a limit saying when because I was wrong last year. Obviously, I think everyone was. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do think we'll see them this year. It's, it's just a, a natural progression of the asset class. But we'll probably also see maybe, uh, and who knows, uh, some other products, the Ether, Litecoin, those coming on as futures as well. And maybe someday even options on those. Who knows? But, yeah, I, I still remain uh, optimistic that we will see some of these this year, despite the kind of dragging of the feet of the two major venues right now, CME and SIBO. All right, next question, B, B Nunes, B Nunes maybe. You want to know what's the truth about Bitcoin as an asset class? Some say crypto is digital gold and it's inversely correlated. Others say that is nonsense. Which is it? Interesting. You kind of asking two two questions here, even though you really it sounds like one. Uh, Could you say crypto and then in, I think you can make that argument certainly for Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself, all the data I've seen, I'm, I'm, maybe you have different maybe you have different data, Toby. But all the data I've seen is that it pretty much is uncorrelated, which is kind of what you want. If you want to, and I've seen a lot of data that it can indeed reduce your sharp ratio of your portfolio with an allocation to it, because it isn't, it's not, it's not an inversely correlated. It's not a flight to quality. It's not digital gold. It is indeed non-correlated. But I wouldn't, you can't 
lump all crypto under that umbrella because there's the, the huge universe of it and they're all are different things. So I think you got to tread lightly when you make that all of crypto is non-correlated because there's coins out there that are. But Bitcoin itself, it seems like so far, has proven to be fairly uncorrelated. Toby, would you concur with that, that it is a reasonably uncorrelated asset class? Yeah, certainly. Uh, um, looking looking at all the data over, I guess, 10 years, it, it's definitely uncorrelated. Um, some pessimists might argue that if it keeps heading towards zero like it has in 2018, then of course it's uncorrelated. But uh, as long as you open up that data window, it, it's certainly uncorrelated. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's yes, you know, early on, obviously, the narrative was, oh, it's it's digital gold. It's, let's have a flight to quality. And then when it didn't perform that way, people were upset. But uh, it's clearly, I think, from the data, it seems like it's fairly non correlated, which can be a good thing. I mean, and we've seen it before when usually when it hits the fan, correlation goes to one across the board and all these things that are supposedly even like gold that are supposedly not supposed to perform like that. But Bitcoin, we haven't really seen that. So that could perhaps be attractive. Uh, there's a question we kind of touched on already. Like I said, this is probably the number two question we received all of last year, Toby. So we kind of have finally are able to answer it. Now this comes from the surreal, surreal gentleman. I like that. That's a good handle. Uh, they ask here, heard, I heard a lot of noise over the past year about how Bitcoin option skew would shape up if they were listed. Any idea how that skew would look? Are the calls bid? Are the puts bid? Are they both bid? So yeah, like I said, Toby, we heard arguments for call skew, bid, call bid, a put bid, and a smile. You kind of touched on it. It sounds like it was pretty much all calls all the time in uh, Q1 into Q2. Then towards the middle of the year, it started shifting, maybe got a little smiley. And then now it's kind of uh, puts or bid. Is that pretty much the story of Bitcoin vol skew for 2018? Yeah, certainly right, Mark. And I think um, we'd expect that to, long term to continue in that um, uh, companies out there that have their revenues in, in Bitcoin, um, I, I used the example earlier of miners because it's a really good example. But um, the, there's, as as the market matures, we'd expect that you know people will be willing to sell upside calls where they have revenues in in crypto assets and uh, spend that premium with protection in in puts. Um, and that's what we've been seeing for a little while now. And we're Probably keep seeing, um, but similar to gold, um, that skew can easily flip. If we see a, um, a hard price run up, um, we'd expect it to flip to that call, just as um, we see in, in the gold markets. I've got a question here from uh, Ellen. Ellen Kemp. I like to see the ladies writing in too, saying uh, she said it seems like the CME uh, CME Bitcoin contract won the horse race uh, this year. Are you surprised? More people seem to prefer a five coin contract versus the one coin SIBO contract. Yeah, that I will admit that did surprise me. I think obviously the sell off kind of helped mitigate that uh, that multiplier a little bit. It's not quite of a me- as much of a meaty beast to trade a five coin contract now as it was back in, let's say, Q1. Uh, so that certainly has helped. But yeah, that that did surprise me. I, out of the gate, I think I, a lot of people were picking the the SIBO contract to smoke it because it was a one coin contract a lot more nuanced a lot more flexible for maybe a lot of people's needs beyond this big at the time it was like a six figure contract that you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of worth of coin for the CME that was a lot uh, but now we've seen the, the exact opposite unfold over over the course of the year did that did that surprise you as much as it did me and a bunch of other people Toby um, in, in some regards, yes. Yeah. Some regards, no. Um, look, like the, the multiplier, the one versus five, yeah, we would have expected to, the one to initially certainly be, be more popular. Um, as the prices run down, that one versus five hasn't been such a big issue. Um, but then it's not surprising in a sense that, you know, CME is a $65 billion company and uh, CBOE is a, a $10 billion company. So CME at six and a half times as big as CVOE, you'd expect it to have more global reach. And you made the point earlier that a lot of the volume's happening overnight. Um, and I think it's, you know, the, the, the stats on volume sort of speak to maybe CME having a, a wider global presence than CVOE. Um, so in that sense, um, maybe not as shocking as first when we first looked at it. I'm going to wrap it up with this one here from uh, Jordan, perhaps the most difficult question of them all. He or she wants to know, what's our outlook for the crypto market in 2019? We'll kind of just give a lot of uh, looking back 
uh, on the show. We can look forward a little bit now, as we kind of alluded to earlier. We've seen kind of a bit of a volume trend and market cap trend, but it seems to, it seems to be maybe somewhat stabilizing here around this four thousand high thirty eight hundred, thirty seven hundred or so level out here in Bitcoin. Volatility certainly has shot up, and that usually does accrete to more volume uh, as a result. Certainly from that nadir of like around twenty back in November when your T bills were were more exciting than 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 Bitcoin for a while there from a vol perspective. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a little bit more of that. Do you think, I mean, talking to your clients and things, are people thinking that maybe this is a, a relative period of stability or do you, are they prepping for maybe more downside? What, do you, what are you hearing from the client base going forward for 2019, Toby? Mike, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here on this call if I knew the answer to that. But, um, sure you'd be. You'd look, be beaming uh, in from your private island, but you'd still be on the show, of course. <laughs> of course I would. You and I together will go to that private island when we figure out the answer to this question. Um, you know, I, I don't expect fireworks like what we saw in, in 2018 um, with, uh, sorry, 2017 with a massive price run up. And, um, you know, I don't expect the um, ship to sort of keep sinking like it did in, in 2018. I think we will find um, more stable uh, range in, in 2019. Um, uh, you know, moving away from Bitcoin, I think the, the space really needs to work on um, evolving the, the use cases and executing on visions. And, um, uh, you know, uh, if you can develop use cases, then you can start developing revenues. You start developing revenues, you can start developing profits. And that's what, that's how we derive asset prices. Um, so we've we've seen a lot of a lot of like underneath the price action we've seen these uh, a lot of companies uh, in the last sort of 12 months start to work towards um, uh, building those use cases and building the infrastructures that are needed um, and as we see that evolve similar to the uh, internet age or the dot com uh, recovery after the crash growth was much slower out of that crash you didn't see a massive overnight recovery and i don't think we'll see that in in crypto either um but i'd expect that you know we do see um uh some more stability in the market than what we've seen the last two years for sure all right everybody that music and what music it is by the way i like that uh, <laughs> what that music means we've come to the close of our inaugural episode here of the Bitcoin Rundown, the launch episode for 2019. We have a lot of great stuff in store for you. Stay tuned. We're still figuring out the exact time, so we were, we were hoping to get it to you this time, but we have a lot of guests coming from all over the world who are on different time frames, so we may have to adjust this time. Uh, we may, it may, we'll see. Maybe we'll, it might have to be just podcast only, maybe not live. We'll see if we can, can't make all the timing work. But uh, stay tuned definitely on the podcast side. You'll be getting more episodes and hopefully on the live side as well once we nail down a time. So for now, it's this time every week, but we'll probably have to move that once we start figuring out everyone's schedules going forward. So look for more more info from us on when exactly you can expect this show. But it will be weekly, so stay tuned for that. And we'll have a lot of great guests from throughout the world of crypto and a lot of great discussion topics and debates and all sorts of fun stuff. As your questions implied, you guys are still very interested in this space. We're interested in it as well. We like to see new products, new interest. I mean, it's really just revolutionized the Chicago trading scene just in the past year. So many firms have been really revitalized by this explosion of interest in crypto. So we like to see that. And I like to see the growing interest in it out there as well. So keep those questions. Keep those queries coming. We do like to hear from you guys. And Toby, before we go, as this inaugural episode here, tell our folks if they're interested in what you guys are doing over there, to, well, before we even get to that, give us a little hint, a little of a tease of what they can expect coming down the pike from you guys at Acuna. And then B, if they're interested in learning more, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, sure, Mark. Um, look, we're uh, really excited to, to be part of the, uh, the podcast, the, the radio network. Um, we're, we're looking forward to discussing the latest in, in crypto markets uh, most weeks. And um, talking to some interesting guests from all over the crypto space and, of course, answering uh, listener questions. Um, for those listeners out there that are interested in uh, Kuna and what we're up to, www.acunacapital.com. Uh, and there's a few different links there depending on what exactly uh, they're looking for uh, and ways they can get in touch with us. There you go. And that's Acuna 
with a K, listeners, A-K-U-N-A, capital.com. Find them on Twitter over there as well at Akuna Capital. And on behalf of Toby and the team over there, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you for tuning in to this inaugural episode. We're looking forward to nailing down a firm time for you guys and putting out some great episodes coming from the Crypto Rundown in the coming weeks. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 